Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to your seventh webinar on e-memory computing for artificial intelligent applications. Uh, I'm Maria Tote from ETP from HPC office. I will be the host of this session and two of my colleagues are here today to help us. Uh, Pascal um, will help us with the chat and the questions and Michael will moderate the technical part of the session. Before we start, a couple of practical information. This webinar is recorded and you will receive the link uh, tomorrow. This webinar is in listen-only mode. Um, you can communicate with us, with the organizers and, um, and the speakers via the question pane that you can find on the Gonto webinar control panel illustrated here. This is on the right-hand side of your desktop. You can see there. You can ask questions anytime during the presentations. We will answer you whenever possible. And we will also address the questions for common interest during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can download um, the handout also from this control panel. Uh, I have uploaded our annual report. Um, you can see the summary of activities what our association have done last year. and. We will also try to include the slides of today's presentation later today. Before looking at the agenda, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with DTP for HPC, it's a non-profit association that promotes European research and innovation in high-performance computing. Uh, we are a private member of EuroHPC. Uh, this is the joint unit of the European Commission on HPC. And our mission is to propose research priorities, fields for funding uh, related to HPC. Today's main topic is artificial intelligence, um, a domain which is very close to HPC. Uh, for that, we have invited Robert Haas from IBM Research, um, and he will present in memory computing for AI applications. Uh, before that, I will quickly introduce our webinar plans for this year. And then my colleague, Michael Mams, will take over the moderation of the technical part and the Q&A session. So let's start with our webinar plans. Uh, we started our webinars last summer. Uh, the idea was to have one session per month presenting different aspects, topics related to HPC, and <clears throat> also uh, presenting our cooperation with other organizations and projects. Uh, we had six sessions so far. We started with the Transclinium Initiative, coordinated by ATP for HPC. Uh, then we made a virtual tour with four of our members um, at IST last summer. Uh, we presented the interactions with, IP, uh, with High Peak in September. We introduced Sparta. It's an easy funded project on cybersecurity. Then in November, um, our industrial user working group organized a session um, to present the view and the experience of four companies, how they use HPC. Um, these companies included like Repsol, Leonardo, Cycles, and Numerism. And uh, finally in December, um, we had a session on artificial intelligence with Claire. Um, it's worth to know that in October, we opened our YouTube channel. Here you can find the link for the recordings of all webinars I just mentioned, as well as other interesting videos. Uh, this year, uh, today's session is the first one, and we will continue organizing one session per month in a fixed time slot uh, from 11 to 12 on Friday mornings. Um, the next session will be on the 16th of April. Um, it will be organized again with our industrial user working group. Jean-Philippe Nominet from CA and Sai Nadazimamurti from Seagate will moderate the session. And we will have speakers from Thales and Airbus to present their standpoint from a large company perspective. Uh, how they use HPC, what challenges they face, what support they need, uh, etc. You can already register for the session with the save the date link. Um, 
that you will have it from this slide, and Pascal will also share with you in the chat soon. On the 28th of May, we will present you Meluxina. This is the Luxembourg UHPC system. Um, Hugo Falter from Partec will moderate the session, and Valentin Plugaro, the CTO of Lux Provide, already confirmed his participation. Uh, we will also have another speaker um, to, to present you different perspectives of the acquisition, installation, how, to, how they plan to use the machine because Meloxina will be installed only in April. So by the time of the webinar, it will be a completely new machine. Uh, you can already register for this session too with the save the date link um, from this slide. And the, the links for registration are in the chat. Great, thanks, thanks Pascal. Uh, and from June, uh, your topic suggestions are very welcome. We have some ideas. Uh, for example, we are considering to continue organizing sessions with our interested user working group on different users' perspective, and also another European HPC, HPC machines. Another idea um, is that once the EuroHPC, once the second phase of EuroHPC will be finalized, uh, we also would like to present it to you. But any further topic suggestions, ideas, uh, that what would be interesting for you are very welcome. You can contact us, send us your suggestions, even send them right now via the question pane. Uh, we would highly appreciate your contribution because we would like to prepare some content that is useful for you. And to summarize, I would like to highlight that you can always find the latest information on our future webinars and other events uh, on our event site. And uh, that we have our YouTube channel where you can find all the plays of the previous webinars, uh, what you have might miss but could be interesting for you. And here is our contact details. So we look forward uh, to hearing your suggestions, your even your questions to, to help us in the future preparations. Um, thank you. This is all I wanted to share with you right now. And I give the floor for the technical part of the presentation. So th thank you, Maria, uh, for the introduction. Um, so today we have a special topic uh, about a new area that we introduced lately into the spectrum of uh, technical topics the ETP for HPC will focus on this year and next year. Uh, we have uh, created a new working group called Unconventional HPC Architectures, uh, focusing on, um, on uh, elements, on technology, on program environments for components, accelerators that are not to be considered in the main line of uh, the business for, for delivering HPC technology. And this memory computing is a perfect uh, example for this area. So I'm very glad that uh, Robert Haas has joined us today to give us a speech. And as you can see, uh, Robert um, is leading an important uh, team in one of the teams in, in the research in Rushlikan from IBM. And his team is focusing on uh, support for AI, cloud, uh, and storage components, and um, therefore this topic is perfectly at the center of the activities of his team and his personal interests. So Robert, thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael, for this invitation to, uh, to give this uh, presentation, and I will try my best to make this uh, exotic topic look uh, very concrete and use illustrations from our ongoing efforts here in my organization. Um, as uh, you just briefly mentioned, Michael, it's one of the four uh, research departments based in uh, IBM uh, Zurich, um, where we have uh, close to 100 people in this department in my organization. And we've been, been engaging in this new area of in-memory computing now for, for quite a few years. So. I, I have plenty of material, uh, most of which is published already, obviously, and you will see the references uh, during the course of this presentation. So if you feel you want to go and deep 
go deeper into any of these things, uh, feel free to go and, and look up these references. I'll try to give you a, a fast brush through this so you actually can appreciate um, how these can actually impact several fields, including HPC and obviously the use of AI in HPC uh, that we see uh, growing. Now, if it goes well, you see my screen and now you should see my lab on this second page. This is the agenda that I would like to cover with you in the next 30 minutes. Um, first of all, we talk about the memory wall and we keep hitting this memory wall. So on the go and, and make it more concrete. Uh, what is it exactly and on how much energy do we actually spend on this? And then introduce the topic of today, which is really circumventing the wall. And, and we will see there are many flavors of in-memory computing. Then clearly we want to look at AI applications of in-memory computing. I will cover three of them and I will show you there is a broad range of applications, not only in AI, that one can take advantage of, uh, uh, where you can take advantage of these new technologies. I will cover, of course, deep learning, inference and training, and I will add with a little bit more descriptive uh, details, something about hyper-dimensional computing that may be new to, to, uh, to many of you. And finally, a little bit of advertisement to encourage community participation around uh, these efforts. And I will go and present two activities, open source activities, where we are welcoming uh, members of this community to also uh, contribute and advance uh, overall uh, the state of knowledge in this space. Okay, without further ado, let's set the stage. So you know very well how the computing demands for training large AI models has been growing exponentially from a few teraflops day some years ago to now thousands of petaflops days. Uh, and clearly, this is becoming more and more unsustainable without significant software and hardware innovation. So let's dig a little bit deeper. Take an example in the middle of this plot, right? A typical ResNet, a modest uh, application doing uh, classification of images with this data set. All of this is very well known. Well, did you consider how much energy is spent to actually do this training, where you need to go and ingest that data set and go through it multiple times with your training algorithms? Well, you can do it over 16 days or over seven hours, but in the end, you will spend the equivalent uh, energy consumption of, uh, of a home over a couple of weeks. This is significant, and this is by far not the largest models that we encounter today. So what's the core issue behind this? It's moving data. Um, it's actually, rather than a memory wall, I would call this a memory mountain. And you can see this mountain upside down on the right hand side of this, uh, of this page. We represent here the amount of energy that is needed to move information from your various levels of memories on chip, off chip, into the processing units in order to perform, let's say, a simple multiplication operation. And you see that the amount of energy needed to perform the operation is excessively small compared to the amount of energy that you needed to bring the operands into that computing unit. So consider applications where you have to go through your data sets many, many times, typically uh, deep learning training, then you essentially hit that memory wall again and again and again. So what kind of operations are we really talking about, right? It's not just this simple multiplication here, it's something a little bit more sophisticated. So if you go through the spectrum of different types of uh, uh, neural nets that are used today, and you look at the types of operations that are uh, essentially composing uh, these, you will notice that there is one that is by far uh, the most popular one, and these are matrix multiplication. And we'll come back to that in a moment, uh, because this is where we will be focusing now, when we introduce in-memory computing, is speeding up in particular, these operations. Now, when we look what happens at the edge, clearly efficiency becomes even more important. I mean, think about all these type of applications in mobile devices, when you do authentication and you use AI for that, speech recognition, 
uh, makes augmented reality. Then there's a meta-processing in the Internet of Everything, uh, Internet of Things, smart cities, homes, smart industry. There is the embedded processing in prosthetics, wearables, uh, healthcare, and then all the autonomous navigation and control with its uh, stringent needs in uh, real-time video analytics and the like. All of these are even particularly constrained in terms of energy and memory, and, and this is a space where in-memory computing can, can make a huge difference. Now, clearly, to address these growing needs uh, that I was just uh, referencing uh, earlier, there's been quite some effort overall in the scientific uh, community and the industry, right? There were advances to sort of uh, fill the gaps in the memory and storage hierarchies by bringing new elements that are faster uh, than the typical uh, storage that we have been using, but also denser. Um, there are many uh, ways of accelerating your workloads, taking advantage of, of course, GPUs, but many other kind of exotic, still von Neumann type of uh, accelerators, uh, all using sometimes also high bandwidth memory. But there is a new kind, which we really try to, to distinguish here, which goes beyond the traditional von Neumann architectures, where we perform operations in place. That is, try to avoid this memory wall and circumvent it by not moving data at all when you need to perform these very popular operations. So what is it exactly therefore we are doing? So on the left-hand side, I represent the traditional way of processing with conventional memory where your control unit, such as your CPU shown here, will need to fetch from memory operands, load them in a cache, perform some arithmetic operations and then return and store the results into that memory. And the memory wall or the bottleneck is, is shown here. What we try to do here is instead move the operations, and clearly I'm not talking about any arbitrary operations, and I will come to that in a second, what kind of operations can effectively be done in this context within the memory itself. Uh, and therefore completely avoid this issue of data movement between memory and a processing. So we are talking about this as in-memory computing, computing in place are many word, uh, ways to refer to that, but this is all the same concept. So let's see what exactly can we do? What kind of operations, logical, basic operations can we do? in the different types of memories that we have available. So if I limit myself to electronics, we can also talk about uh, uh, photonics uh, and the like, and this is also an area where there is uh, lots of investigations going on. But let's look at the more traditional electronics, two types um, that we can use, two types of memories. They are called resistance-based, right? Where the state is essentially encoded by the resistance uh, of these elements. And we will see what kind of elements these are. There's a variety of them. Uh, and then you have charge-based memories. So traditional DRAM of SRAM that, that, that store their state as a charge can also be used when you combine these various DRAM cells or SRAM cells in a way that you can perform operations on their content in place. So let's look a little bit more in detail what type of operations we are talking about here. In this first case, uh, the resistance here that is uh, set to a certain value, so it's a memristor, right? You can program the resistance that you want to, to, uh, to achieve in here. Um, when you apply it a certain voltage, essentially uh, by just uh, using uh, uh, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law, you will measure the addition of the two currents coming out of this uh, resistance, compare this to a reference current in a sense amplifier shown at the bottom. And depending on the values of these two resistance, and here for sake of simplicity, it's essentially either zero or one, right? So they can be both zeros, zero and one, one and zero and one and one. You can actually measure the outcoming uh, current that you can see here, compare it to the reference current, and I think quite easily you will deduce that essentially, uh, depending on the, the reference that you set, 
you can actually perform an or operation or an and operations of these uh, two states. This is therefore performed in place. There is no movement uh, of data of uh, states from a memory to a processing unit. This is really the actual computational memory doing its job. Now take another example here. Now we will move to charge-based memory. So the state is represented as a charge um, in these uh, capacitors or in these SRAM cells. They work in a similar way. Uh, clearly, they have very clear differences, but uh, the principle remains more or less the same. You can actually decide, set the stage, uh, set the state of these capaci capacitors to various values. They can be zero and ones just for simplicity here, uh, as you can see. You can decide by setting uh, the value of your uh, selector, which type of operation you will want to perform. And when you essentially open uh, these transistors, you will see the redist redistribution of the charges take place, right? You essentially see this here, the voltages will, uh, will average. And you compare again this voltage to a reference voltage using your sense amplifier. And depending on where you've set your references, you will perform an AND operation or an OR operation. Again, in place with the state of uh, these uh, DRAM cells here, essentially uh, computed uh, with these operations in place. Same goes with SRAM cells. Uh, without going to much more detail, but you can see here more or less the same setup as I've shown in the other two examples. And again, depending on the set uh, state of these two SRAM cells that are shown in blue here in the middle, uh, and the output that you will measure from these sense amplifiers here, you can perform an AND operation or a NOR operations uh, out of these. So this is just to introduce the basics you see that here we are doing very simple and or uh, and nor operations out of these uh, binary values. So, but we're interested to do more than this, right? As I said before, what is the kind of operation that uh, is dominant, especially in deep learning and training and, and inference as well? These are matrix vector op, uh, operations. So how do you map these matrix vector operations to such a construct. Well, this is an example of how you can do that by using resistive memory. So I'm showing here a crossbar, crossbar array of, uh, of the same element that I was showing on the, on the previous page, where the conductance of each of these uh, memory stir can be programmed and they map to the weights of this matrix so that the A values here shown in this matrix are essentially proportional to the conductance values that you see in each of these uh, resistors. The input voltage that you apply to this crossbar array here, uh, V, is essentially proportional to the values of your uh, vector. And when you perform essentially the operation, you measure the output currents the way I just explained earlier, and you do the, summit, the multiplication and addition uh, of those, you will essentially result uh, in a vector that is proportional to the currents that you've measured here. So what is particular about these? These operations essentially take place virtually in no time, right? We don't need to have a certain number of cycles take place to bring data in, perform an operation, and get the data out. That's why we say it happens in order of one time complexity. And it exploits just what I explained earlier the very simple Ohm's and Kirchhoff's circuit laws. Now, we have done this. Uh, we have implemented this. We have actually created uh, a chip uh, back uh, three, four years ago using PCM devices, phase change memory, so uh, a material uh, made out of germanium, antimony, and, and tellurium, a, a compound of these three uh, elements. Uh, PCM essentially is a phase change material where the, uh, the conductance depends on its uh, crystallization state. You can change the crystallization state uh, by pushing pulses uh, into, into that resistance and, and accordingly 
program that resistance to the desired value. Now, exactly what I showed before in these schematics, we have implemented this matrix vector multiplication using uh, these devices uh, in the crossbar array using a 19 nanometer CMOS chip, 1 million PCM devices in total. And we've shown, and this is quite important, right? That despite the fact that this is all analog, right, these devices have a crystallization state that can vary quite a bit. Uh, there, is, there is no binary uh, digital state, it's an analog uh, chip. Despite this, when we perform this uh, vector matrix vector multiplication, the result of this uh, operation that we measure here, B, is actually very close to the exact value that you would, uh, you would reach when you do a four-bit fixed-point arithmetic uh, operations. So this is a very promising result. It shows that for applications where absolute precision may not be required, and this is often the case in many of these AI applications, this is actually a substrate that could function very well. Now, let me move on and take uh, essentially now a look at how you could do the same thing, but instead of using um, what I explained earlier, um, uh, we are now using not resistance, we are using charges. So charges using SRAM cells that will control how we discharge uh, a certain capacitor where we essentially uh, will uh, enter the value of the vector that we want to multiply. So just to recap here, such that it's a very much the same setup that you've seen before, there are four coefficients in your matrix. They are essentially binary here. Um, they are mapped into the value of each of these SRAM cells. The coefficients of your input vector X here is essentially uh, what we will charge the capacitors at each of these uh, nodes. Um, X1 and X2, and then the result of the multiplications of these will correspond to uh, what we will measure as the, uh, the voltages, as I explained earlier, uh, from the columns when we, we read out after shorting each of these capacitors. So there's a little procedure here of three steps, which is relatively basic, which allows us to perform the charging, essentially, uh, then the reading, the discharging, and measuring the output, which is essentially proportional to the result of this matrix vector multiplication. So this was using SRAM cells, right, different from the PCM technology that we showed on the previous page. We have done to essentially validate the, the use of, of this capability, this SRAM technology. We have actually de defined a design uh, for a multi-bit, in-memory matrix vector multiplier. So what I showed now was a was single bit, SRAM cells can only be binary, but you can actually pipeline many of these cells together to represent weights in your matrix that are more than binary, that are multi-bit. Clearly, this is what we need to, uh, to achieve as well. And this design that you can show here is interesting because it shows, you can probably see it a little bit, that the majority of the area on that chip is actually essentially uh, used for the SRAM cells themselves, right? Hold the, the coefficient of your matrix. And then a smaller fraction of that chip is the in-memory computing overhead, right? All the peripheral circuits, the decoders, the read and write circuitry, the finite state machines, the analog to digital converters, they are essentially represented mostly on that part of the figure. Now, we wanted to also measure the precision that one can achieve by performing these matrix vector multiplications in place uh, using SRAM technology. And the simulation that you show, that you see on the right hand side, uh, captured the thermal noise, the device mismatches, transistor mismatches, capacitor mismatches, and so on and so forth. And, and despite all of these, the obtained results uh, that we can uh, see here, which is essentially the, the little uh, red uh, crosses that you see uh, on both sides of this uh, uh, black line, these results are very close to what would be the truncated output of a full precision fixed point operation. Um, again, so it's not absolutely precise, but it's very close and sufficiently precise uh, for many operations. This design that we, we have shown here and that just appeared in Transactional VLSI is definitely not 
the one that is the most efficient in every single respect. But we uh, calculated that it would deliver an equivalent of 17 teraops uh, per watt with six bit weights and inputs. And that's about five times better if you scale for the, for the, 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 the bit precision, five times better than you would get with the most power efficient GPU based accelerator uh, on the market today. And again, as I said, this is by far not optimized uh, to the fullest extent. Okay, so we've seen how you can actually perform logical operations, matrix vector multiplications in place in different types of memories uh, as, uh, as we've seen. Now let's look at applications. So what are the kind of applications that you would like to possibly perform with these? I'm gonna take you through three examples, obviously uh, deep learning inference, deep learning training, as well as hyperdimensional computing. And I illustrate all of these three with real lab results uh, that we have done using chips. Some of them I've introduced uh, uh, just a moment ago. Clearly, there is more that one could uh, try and apply these technologies to. I mean, scientific computing, however, their high degree of precision is required. There are ways to overcome these uh, limitations uh, and use in memory computing also for, for these cases. It's not the topic of uh, this presentation today, but there are several, re several references out there that show how this can possibly be done. There are also applications of this, uh, this technology that can serve uh, security purposes, random number generators, and so on and so forth, but that's not uh, the topic of this case. Let's focus on these three examples that are quite representative of the, of the spectrum that one, you can go and apply this for deep learning and other type of uh, AI applications. First of all is deep learning inference. So you recognize here the same crossbar arrays that I was uh, explaining before. Now we have a little bit more circuitry and, uh, and components around this to orchestrate uh, all of those. Now that we're gonna put them in sort of a pipeline with a communication network so that each of these crossbar arrays that will perform matrix vector multiplication will correspond to one of the synaptic layers in this deep neural network that takes an image as it inputs and puts uh, and, and essentially tells us uh, how to classify it uh, properly. So each of these layers maps to one of these matrices and then will perform the inference by reading the inputs, performing the matrix vector multiplication, getting the output, and passing this along to the next crossbar array in the pipeline. Each of these operations individually here perform in O1 complexity, uh, as I said already. Now, let's look at, uh, let's look at some, uh, some results that one can uh, achieve out of these. So we took uh, typical ResNet32, right, uh, on uh, doing Cypher 10 image classification. Uh, clearly, there were limitations to the size of the networks we could go and implement on the real chip, the chip I presented earlier. Um, and by doing off-chip training, so training the model not in that chip, training the model in, in your typical uh, uh, CPU environment, but doing a mapping of the weights that you want them to implement and program each of these uh, crossbar arrays with, doing that mapping in an intelligent way taking into consideration the noise that will essentially be, be present in here, the fact that this is analog and not a, a digital accelerator, by doing this in a, in a proper way, so injecting noise during the training phase, we've shown that you could actually reach an inference accuracy on this PCM-based technology that is very close to that that you would do if you used a essentially full precision uh, digital, tip, uh, digital chip uh, alternative. So possible to achieve software equivalent classification accuracies. That's, that's the first thing I wanted to highlight here from an inference perspective. Next example, deep learning training. So now, again, we have a network, but we are going to try and train it. We're going to modify the weights as we go through the forward and backward propagations that will adjust the weights in order to correct for the errors that we will uh, uh, notice when we do the classification over and over and over again uh, on that data sets. 
So again, the synaptic weight will reside in the computational memory in these crossbars. The forward and backward propagation will be performed in place in lower precision, right? It's not the digital FP32 that I showed before, it's lower precision. But there's one thing that you need to perform with higher precision. These are the weight updates. This needs to be done in higher precision because otherwise you will never get a good accuracy out of these networks. So in the end, you need a mixed precision, essentially a computational memory with your crossbar array on the right-hand side, and a high precision unit that will help compute the weight updates with the necessary precision so that in the end you get proper accuracy. So what is the accuracy that we measured? Again, I'm going to show you an example. This is now a uh, handwritten digits uh, classification using a, a very simple uh, network here where you see the number of input neurons. Each input neuron will take a pixel out of this image. There are 784 of them. Then we have one hidden layer in this neural network and then 10 output neurons essentially to tell us which out of the 10 digits is it that we are uh, trying to recognize here. Um, we implemented these. Uh, there were about uh, 400,000 devices, PCM devices used to implement that on the chip I showed before. Now you want to measure as you train your system, what is the accuracy? Uh, using the training data set or using a, a test data set. And you see here the differences between using a 64-bit, I mean, full precision architecture versus running this on our in-memory computing analog uh, devices. And you see the precision, which remains relatively close uh, to, the, to the full precision. So that's one first really good uh, 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 result out of this. The other good result is that over time, if you let your device, uh, this is non-volatile memory, so you can switch it off, switch it on, uh, you let your device out there, and then you come back once uh, in an hour, once in a day, once in a week or a month, and you measure again the accuracy uh, of, uh, of, the, of the inference that you get out of these, you notice that it actually remains very stable here. Actually, we have these devices in our labs for over two years now and we keep measuring the accuracy and it remains pretty much constant. Um, this is not uh, evident. It means, I mean, obviously there is, there are multiple phenomena taking place in, in these uh, materials. Uh, there is drift and so on, but we are able to compensate for these things and maintain the accuracy also over a longer period of time. So I captured two examples. I'm going to finish with one on hyperdimensional computing. But since it's quite far from the typical deep learning that we are probably uh, uh, very familiar with, let me just introduce what it is. Uh, this professor um, at UC Berkeley introduced that concept uh, more than 10 years ago. And his observation was that the remarkable fluidity of memory, the way in which items are pulled spontaneously and effortlessly from our memory by vague similarities to what is currently occupying our attention. Essentially, he, he realizes that the brain is massive in terms of neuron and synapses, it's very robust, um, and felt that, look, I mean, maybe representing computing operations with hyperdimensional vectors, binary vectors, so really long vectors, 10,000 dimensions in these vectors, could actually be a good representation of how this complexity in number of neuron and synapses in, in our brain uh, actually happens. So you have vectors in the hyperdimensional space, since there are so many dimensions, chances are these vectors are orthogonal to each other, right? You can see here the Hamming distances as you increase the number of dimensions of your vectors, 10,000 uh, dimensions, uh, essentially, I mean, your, your vectors uh, end up being all orthogonal to each other. And we want to go and use now this property, uh, manipulate these vectors to, effect, to, to actually perform machine learning tasks. So I'm going to give you one example that we implemented also again on the chip earlier. So you have a number of languages uh, that you would like to recognize, right? So how do you go and uh, do this uh, using hyperdimensional vectors? So first you need to encode what is the sentence you like to go and figure in what languages is it. So let's say each bin, each bin, there are actually six letters, one space. We're going to take trigrams. We are first going to take for each letter a random hyperdimensional vector. So let's say that I maps to this uh, HD vector, and then we are going to go 
and perform operations to move the I, actually, I'm sorry, the red box here should extend a little bit more to I, C, and H. So you need to shift your I by three positions because it's at the beginning of the trigram. Uh, letter C actually shift by one position because it's in the middle. Letter H doesn't need to shift, it's at the end of the trigram. You essentially have these three vectors, you're going to bind them together, performing the next operations, and this hyperdimensional vector represents the trigram ish. You're going to do the same thing again now by moving the window one to the right, now CH and space, and you can see here the resulting hyperdimensional vector, and then you move to the right once more until you reach the end of this uh, short sentence. And then essentially you bundle all of these uh, five trigrams together to represent the full sentence. So bending operations, which is uh, accumulates and threshold of all these hyperdimensional vectors. So this is just to essentially explain how we map this sentence into a vector in our hyperdimensional space. And you have letters uh, mapping to each of uh, a single random uh, hyperdimensional vector. Now, Let's do language classification, right? So first you need to train. You train your systems using uh, 100,000 words. You take sentences. You look up the in your item memory the, the vectors for each of these letters. You perform the operation I've just explained uh, now. You do this encoding, and you come up with a single vector for your entire book here that you have just read in a certain language uh, that could be German. And this is the vector that you put in this associative memory. So we've done that over 21 uh, languages. And then you do the testing phase. So the testing phase means you take a test sentence. Let's take this sentence as an example here. You will go and compute using the encoding operation what is the equivalent HD vector that represents the test sentence. And then you will go and find the closest vector that is in your associative memory of 21 languages to that uh, query uh, sentence, the one with the smallest Hamming distance. Now, we've implemented that in particularly using this. So we have a crossbar array that has all the 27 letters. Uh, and then we perform all the operations uh, that I said, the binding and bundling and the like. Some of them are performed in place. Some of them need to be performed on the periphery. And out of this, you essentially compare the result of uh, your test uh, sentence, uh, the vector coming out of the test sentence, to what you have stored in this associative memory of all the vectors of all these 21 languages and find the one that is the closest to them. So AT computing is particularly suitable when using PC PCM because, um, and, and this uh, large uh, array because these vectors are big and therefore you don't wanna go and move all this data back and forth. So as much as can be performed in place, uh, the better. Second thing is, hyperdimensional vectors, you can flip many of the bits in the 10,000 dimension vectors, you will actually not affect the result of the computation. So it's very robust, which is good in particularly when we are dealing with these kind of analog memories. And what we've shown already is this simple, let's say toy example, has already a 10 times better uh, performance than using a traditional ASIC-based implementation. All of this with an accuracy that is within 2% of what you will perform using full precision software-based implementation. So we've, did, we've done that for languages. This was the example I've just shown here. We've done that also for classification of news and EMGs, hand gesture recognition for electromyography. Uh, there are many use cases that you can think of using that. So I wanted to highlight this because it's different from the deep learning. Uh, it's not using deep neural networks. It's using a different concept that is also taking advantage of this substrate of in-memory computing in a very advantageous fashion. I'm reaching the end of the presentation. Um, be happy to take questions, but uh, just before that, well, I've already mentioned these. Let me jump to the to the last two pieces when, when it's about community participation. So some of the work that I've presented here has been uh, open sourced, uh, is accessible uh, out there using uh, for instance, what we call the Analog AI Hardware Acceleration Toolkit. We have capabilities that allow um, uh, people to experiment and simulate analog in-memory computations, uh, simulate a wide range of devices and cross-bar configurations that account for 
for the drift and the static st statistical uh, noise model. So you are welcome to go and use that. Uh, PyTorch uh, integration is available here, as you can see as this, uh, in this short snippet. Um, another example of, uh, of uh, open sourcing that we have made here is about the computing and the compilers that one would like to use in order to transparently take models in typical frameworks, uh, be TensorFlow and so on, and map your neural network into such an architecture composed of all these crossbar arrays or cores that you can see here at the bottom and organize the communication between those in the pipeline fashion. So uh, there is uh, such uh, uh, a early uh, compiler that we made available that takes this uh, model and brings it into the operations and the routing and the orchestration of the data movement uh, into this accelerator, both for training and inference. What's next in AI hardware? Well, we've looked at uh, the introduction of uh, obviously mixed precision computing, pushing the boundaries of what we achieve with traditional CMOS. On top of that, bringing the additional dimension of in-memory computing, trying to circumvent the memory wall and then using different types of elements. Uh, we, we went through a, a series of them, but uh, things will still keep on moving, right? There are more and more inspirations that we take from, uh, from our brains, what we call biologically plausible networks. Uh, these come in various forms. Spiking neural networks uh, is an example of this. There is also lots of work involving hyperdimensional computing uh, and, and bringing even these concepts together that is taking place today. And this should help us go and, and serve the future needs of our very, very uh, expensive uh, deep learning and other types of tasks. And I'll finish with a, a piece of uh, advertisement. So the submission deadline is already passed, but you will soon see a new special theme uh, in the uh, Earthsim news, specifically on brain inspired computing, that uh, uh, Michael Pfeiffer at Robert Bosch and myself have been putting together as guest editor, uh, and will take essentially uh, a good cross section of European research activity, also going pushing the boundaries beyond uh, taking advantage of what I've, I've shown here and, and exploring things such as spiking neural networks. Uh, hyperdimensional computing and even more. So I recommend uh, next month you look in your mailbox or look up on the website uh, this latest issue of the RC News. So with this, I will be done and I'm really happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Robert. This was fascinating and uh, gave us an, um, a quick look into uh, this uh, new technology arena. So we'd like to um, go through the questions. Uh, we have five or six questions. Let me read the first one. If you go back, um, Robert, to page number 14, there is a question. Uh, I will share the question in the chat. Yes. Okay. And Robert, you should be able to see the questions because I assigned them to you in the questions panel. I'm going to go straight to page 14. So, yep, here we go. And the question is, if you select two rows concurrently, you get additional uh, currents without selector devices. Can you comment, please? So you will select, um, essentially, by applying your voltage, uh, the different rows that you are interested in, right? They represent your input. Um, here, the, the read voltage, the various value of X1, and x2 and essentially the outcome of these will be a current or no current flowing through these uh, memristors that you will then measure uh, out of these actually i just realized here i put this upside down so we are coming in from the bottom here with the voltage that we apply and measuring the currents here uh, in in the rows so uh, you will you will actually select if you see here, you will select essentially the multiplication of this voltage by this conductance, this voltage by this conductance, the addition of the different currents, and essentially you're performing the multiplication of these two values. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I hope, I, I hope I'm clear. I realize that I had here the 
put it upside down. So it's just a transpose of the matrix, but uh, the principle is exactly the same. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is, um, is it possible, so there is no, there is no link to a page, uh, is it possible to build a more general purpose system using the memory computation in PCM? You might see the question from Bezad Salami. Okay, more general purpose. I mean, as I, as I said in the introduction, the, the type of functions that one can go and apply here is not arbitrary. Right? I mean, it's limited by, by, by some of the physics that I have tried to describe uh, very, very, uh, very quickly. Um, so the type of functions that we are able to offload here is a, is a subset of your general purpose functions. But when you look at the type of operations that are dominant in your applications, be it deep learning with matrix vector multiplications, and the matrix vector multiplication, by the way, is seen in many, many other types of operations in, in applications beyond just deep learning. So, so it is very broadly uh, applicable. Then the, 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 the hyperdimensional uh, binding, bundling operations of these long vectors that you can efficiently do in place. I mean, I think this is where we should be looking at. I mean, how, what are the dominant operations or new frameworks that have uh, a massive need for such operations that can be most effectively performed in place? I, I'm not expecting we'll be able to go and create a general purpose computer um, out of these uh, in-memory in computing devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there is a related question. Um, uh, what about architectures? How is data coherency handled? How are you programming your circuit? A very good point. So, so clearly, I mean, we, we need to pay attention to that. I, I didn't dive into the detail, except maybe at the very end of my presentation, where I showed you how we need to orchestrate uh, the movements, the programming of your data in these devices. And for this, uh, there is uh, ongoing work, uh, creating compilers and so on. So it, it's, uh, it's clearly, I mean, uh, something that needs to be paid attention to. Uh, we've shown that this can be done uh, at a scale where you have multiple cores that have to come together to perform maybe multiple layers uh, of your deep neural network, ensuring the, the coherency and uh, making sure that, I mean, you, you reach the accuracy that you are expecting from these devices, uh, obviously. So architecture-wise, system integration and so on, this is, I would say for us in the research community, the next major aspect that needs to be uh, tackled more deeply. Uh, there is clearly work out there that is already addressing some of these, but uh, I mean, there, there will be a need for more effort here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then there one more. Uh, yes, there's one more question. Uh, so these devices will become perhaps a kind of specific accelerator device or some specific application or application type? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so obviously the industry will invest when these applications become very uh, uh, widespread, right? I, I wanted to illustrate that, uh, for instance, on the edge side, we, we clearly believe that this is a, a booming opportunity uh, where efficiency is particularly uh, important, right? Energy, memory constraints, and so on and so forth. So we need to focus and see what kind of technologies. There is a, a number of flavors. I, I've explained uh, some examples of these with PCM and SRAM and others that one can go and, and consider to serve the needs in these various kind of uh, uh, setups. But, um, but there is clearly a need to focus on those that have the most uh, stringent needs uh, one could expand over time, and clearly, while the data center energy footprint may not necessarily be the most critical uh, issue, at least not for, for everyone, but we know some of them for whom this is already the case, uh, this is an issue here at the edge that uh, nobody can, can escape. So I believe this is where the, the highest potential lies in front of us for using this technology. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Next, next question. I assume the grids are of fixed size. So how can small matrix vectors calculations 
be performed efficiently, for instance, convolutational kernels? Yeah, so, so they, they can be of uh, small sizes, but you can go and and use smaller areas than, than the, uh, the grids that I've just uh, shown here. So you don't need to necessarily really leverage every time the full size uh, grid. And there are ways to optimize the layout of these uh, convolution kernels in this crossbar arrays uh, clearly that I've not gone into detail here, but you can see in some of the publications that I reference. Okay, so the next question is not a question, it says, Thank you for your answer. So uh, this comes from somebody who has been asking a question before. So this is the set of questions. Maybe to end, um, Robert, can you expand? You have mentioned this a few times, but give us a view of um, the commercial roadmap for this technology. I see that you are uh, looking at advancements in this underlying technology, programmability, usability are certainly issues that are being tackled. Uh, so, how does this? What is the takeoff of this uh, 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 this concept of in-memory computing over the next, let's say, five five years? Uh, so, this is my personal uh, point of view. It's not representing anything with respect to any uh, uh, product roadmaps and and the like that I may be aware of. So, from my personal point of view, I believe that technology is getting ripe. Uh, using some of the examples I've, I've, I've shown uh, here for, for coming into production in the next two to three years. So wh while we've talk, we talk and, and quantum is still very important uh, and will, will affect us in a way that, I mean, we can hardly sometimes even imagine uh, yet. And that's why it's important that we get uh, ready for it as soon as possible. This neuromorphic uh, technology, this in-memory computing, is something that is going to affect us a lot earlier than this. Uh, by, by judging from the maturity of the experiments that uh, I, I can see inside IBM, but also uh, outside there, I think this is, this is not going to take many years until one can go and take advantage of these technologies. There will be, beyond just the hardware aspects, the needs to uh, create the proper ecosystems, uh, the software stacks that will come to this uh, clearly will be very important and will we'll decide also of who are the winners in in this uh, space. And I mean, that's why I also highlighted this as a, a major aspect that needs to be uh, studied and, and developed uh, to ensure that uh, these technologies can, can have this maximum in, uh, impact um, uh, everywhere. Okay. So, thank you very much, Robert. I would like to give now um, Maria or Pascal the last two minutes. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Ah. Oh, there's one more that came in late. Ah, yeah, okay. There's one more from, from Michael. Uh, and also, is there a roadmap to integrate this kind of device in existing HPC technologies? with current storage technologies, for example, or is this too early? So how will we integrate these? I mean, how can we possibly integrate these? Uh, I would say, I mean, from a hardware perspective, right? In a similar way that we integrate GPUs in HPC environment. So uh, the future is uh, heterogeneous. The future is more exotic. Uh, we talk about neomorphic, talk about quantum and so on. They will complement the traditional HPC technology that we are used to, and they, they will go and take off some of the tasks that they can most efficiently perform. And I highlighted some examples uh, of these here. So I can well imagine that you have a PCIe attached accelerator to your HPC uh, nodes that will take off some of these uh, functions that uh, I highlighted here, perform them in place. Uh, all of these orchestrated by the nodes, the uh, the main uh, CPU uh, that will take advantage of maybe more than one such uh, accelerator or and one kind of such accelerators in the future. So the future is becoming hybrid and heterogeneous and so on. And this is probably one of the challenges we'll need to embrace even more and more on the HPC side. Okay, thank you. So now back to you, Maria and Pascal. So just to close, uh, I would like to say thank you. 
thank you, Robert, for your presentation, and also thank you, Michael and Pascal, for your help today. Uh, I would like to ask everyone to fill in our survey. Uh, you can find it once you leave the webinar. And we would appreciate if you could complete that to help us improve our future webinars. And you will also receive the follow-up email tomorrow with the links to the recordings and also with the slides of today. And on behalf of ETP for HPC and our presenter, thank you for joining us today. And we hope to see you again in April on our next webinar. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Goodbye.